what's in store for the Texas legislature in 2015. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Laurel. Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. The 84th Texas legislature begins January 13th, 2015. During this 140-day session, the bills and budgets passed will help shape the laws and financial expenditures for the next two years. In fact, one of the first issues the legislature may be required to tackle is how to pay for any unpaid bills from the prior session. In addition, for the first time in more than 10 years, a new governor and lieutenant governor will be in office. So tonight we ask, how will this impact our legislature? What are the big issues facing both Texas lawmakers and the people come 2015? And what are the short and long-term challenges facing the Lone Star State? To help guide us through this evening's discussion, we are pleased to welcome Senator Sylvia Garcia, representing Texas District 6, and Paul Betancourt, Senator-elect, Texas District 7. And as always, leading our discussion, our hosts, David Jones and Gary Polland. Thank you, Linda. And David, you know, this is really exciting. This is kind of an example of what the new Texas Senate's going to look like. You know, Republicans and Democrats uh, having a good time together. And, and it's county officials, by the way. Exactly. Right? Well, it's probably the, the first time it's happened. For I, I, I would think so. Uh, and, I, and you have some big shoes to fill, Mr. Bencourt, because you're filling the shoes of the present uh, lieutenant governor-elect, uh, Dan Patrick. Well, he had a pretty good election night and uh, and has a pretty good mandate. And I can say that his two issues that he talked about constantly, David, which was border security and property tax relief, he's serious about getting that done. In fact, he said that he wouldn't pass a budget without property tax relief uh, in his acceptance speech. Yes, uh, I, I understand, Gary. Well, that, I'm going to ask Sylvia a question. You've had, a, you've had a lot, about 20 years to get that uh, one done. Uh, let's, let's, okay. let's, let's. Well, Sylvia. The, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt. So <laughs> I'll give you some interrupt you. You're going to ask me, can we really do property tax relief? Well, no, no. I, no, I just want to first talk about border control. Because, border control. Uh, you know, we've had, we had Leticia Van de Pute on, and she also talked about border control. And I know you, you may have a different concept of how we need to go about solving this problem with the border. So what, it, what should we do? Well, I think, first of all, I think we need to recognize and acknowledge that there's never been as much emphasis placed on border border security from the administration and in fact I think that many of us still call him affectionately you know behind the scenes you know the the porter in chief because he's done nothing but put money down there uh, so I think that is a role for the federal government I really did not like the way we handled uh, the situation uh, because I think that those uh, sheriffs that I've talked to down there some of the mayors that I personally have spoken to I would prefer for them to be able to handle those law enforcement issues locally. They have the relationships, they know the area, uh, they, they don't see that crime wave down there. In fact, it's probably safer than, I read somewhere that the border uh, towns were safer than, than Plano, Texas. So I think it's uh, an issue that's sort of made up. It's been made up for the presidential campaign. It's 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 pandering for voters in Iowa, and it's not really taking care of. Well, is well, property tax relief a made up? Is that a made up issue? No, property tax relief is a serious issue, but it's a question of whether what role do we have in Austin? Because property taxes really is a local tax issue, uh, local matter. I mean, we do not receive property taxes. We don't really make the assessments. Paul used I to think, be the taxman. Maybe he can say, well, where we're going to gain the revenue lost. You know, I think it's a question of the, 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 uh, the cap on uh, the appraisals. Uh, and, and the one area that I think we need to do something on and we can do, it, do, uh, do something is equalizing the, the tax burden to ensure that the property taxpayers that are homeowners are paying the same kind of taxes that commercial property owners are paying. Because right now, commercial property owners are paying less. Well, we need some progress here. So we need some equalization. Well, Senator, Senator Redcourt once had a chance to do something about that because he was the tax man once. Well, I did, yes, and I used to go and do what we need to do, which is as values go up, you need to tell people to lower their tax rates. And the problem that we have is that we're not doing that. We've had an increase of, of HISD and revenue for 13% for the last two years. And of course, the tax rates actually increased due to debt service. Same thing with Houston Community College. City did a slight tax rate cut. The county held it steady. The result is the average home in HISD is having a $450 increase in taxes in one year. Now, what's happening is this. Everybody understands Robin Hood. They've heard it, but it's really school equalization and finance. As the local property taxpayers pay more, the state pays less. And in this next uh, budget that we, in fact, I think Sylvia, you were at the finance committee meeting when I questioned the forecast. 
uh, and I'm not from the floor because we're not members yet, obviously, but I just looked at it and went to the chairman and said, they're over, I mean, they're under budgeting how much money the state gets back because they don't pay school districts, and that's $4 billion. So the state has an interest in property taxes because as everybody pays more, they pay less, and they keep the money in the budget. So I think we need to get that money back to the taxpayers, both residential and commercial. Well, one of the, the question is, how do you do that? I mean, yes, we have an interest. We have to watch it. But we don't set the tax rate. That's done locally. So what is it that, that you know, it's good to say you're going to lower property taxes, but what exactly are you proposing? Well, How are we going to do that from Austin? Well, there's a real easy way, which is as values go up, there's a, a section of the code, it's Chapter 26, called Truth and Taxation, where as values go up, you can change the rollback rate. And that puts pressure on jurisdictions to lower the rate instead of just keeping all the money. And that's the state law. Now, also, too, we can look at uh, other uh, combinations of, um, you know, the state has this uh, as an exemption for schools, for all, basically all homeowners with a ex uh, homestead exemption. Uh, you could look at doubling that, per se. You could also look at helping businesses with inventory taxes because those are the ones that really hurt them. But if you um, double the exemption, then you just end up having to have the school districts have to pay more because they've got to make that up somewhere. No, because remember, you've got that $4 billion Robin Hood credit that you can use and you can, doubling the school, I mean, the homestead exemption only takes about $1.2 billion. There's different tools that you can use in the no, toolkit. But, but David, uh, mm. but, Sylvia, some of these only <laughs> take a majority vote to pass. <laughs> David, Sylvia, Sylvia mentioned uh, appraisal cap. And so I was, and I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, do you have an idea, Sylvia, that the present appraisal cap of 10% is too high? No, I do not. I think it's it's probably where it needs to be, and I think unless we need to do it because, again, I'm concerned about the, the homeowners paying more than commercial property taxpayers. I think there's been some studies that have been done. I think Travis County, uh, their court, uh, did a, a survey and a review, and I think Harris County did one recently, and they are finding that commercial property taxpayers, by and large, pay less taxes than uh, property homeowners. So if we have to make a change to equalize that, uh, I think the other thing we need to do is to make sure that commercial property uh, owners tell us how much they pay for their, their property, because right now they don't have to. Do so you want disclosure? Disclosure. Well, that's, uh, that's not uh, likely to happen. Well, uh, so, Paul, you, think, can, you can explain this to Sylvia, because you're a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans don't No, I know why it doesn't happen. It's called lobby, Republicans, okay, Republicans I mean, don't I mean, take on corporate wealth. They don't take on business. Okay, so these off, adjustments will not be made. Here are the facts of what's happening in Harris County. I'm not sure what study she's talking about. But first off, the state looked at the commercial values and rated them at last year at 101% of actual. Now, downtown buildings, 33 of them, class AA+. Plus. In the last two years, they're up 71%. Think about this. 71% in two years. So they may have been undervalued in the past, but take let's say they were at 60%. They're now at 102% of value. So all this stuff, the, the tax business never stays static. It always changes. So um, so the, the, that data is a little bit out of date because, look, when you look at a 71% increase, it means that the rents are going up $8, 9 $10 a foot, and we're already hearing about people bailing out of downtown because the rent's too high. All right, well, we, we know that that's going to be one not, of your agenda items. I don't know where you're hearing. Let's, I'm not hearing anybody bailing out. I'm, I'm hearing, you know, they're, they're, they can't find they enough space for people moving if we, if we had Trust an hour, we, if, we had, if we had an hour, we could talk Building about, about management property association will tell you. Right. For okay. 20 minutes, we could go for it, but we don't have an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> my question <laughs> to you, Mr. Bencourt, is will you be offering a minimum wage bill that would raise our minimum wage, our state minimum wage, to $10? No, but I respect Sylvia, too. <laughs> and, well, I would and probably sign on as a sponsor, because I, I, I do think a, a, a bill will be, be filed. Uh, I, I don't, it will not be me, but I will probably join right, as a let's, sponsor. Let's talk about it. Because it's so, because it's, David, it's necessary because right now you've got people just sort of piecing together two or three minimum wage jobs because no job pays enough to really support a family. When you've got so many people that are earning money on a, on a minimum wage that still can meet the poverty guidelines of this, of this country, that's a shame. 
And Texas has more people in that category than probably any yeah. other state. But Texas has more people in jobs, real jobs. But they're We're not good but, paying jobs, oh, yeah, Paul. Oh, no, they are. We, you look at the, the Paul, oil. Paul, if you don't oh. make but nothing but minimum wage, you can't maintain Sylvia, a family of four. Sylvia, the average four. oil patch job is $80,000, $90,000, $100,000. But those salaries okay. are out of sync with the rest of the state. No, this is the, we're in the job creation magnet of the United States, and we're in the capital of the oil industry in, you know, nas internationally. And, and look down right now, drive on any freeway in this town, and you'll see crane after crane of all these evil business old owners putting up uh, commercial well, buildings. Yeah. Because, because there's real business there, and people can make money mm -hmm. at their, at, with their jobs and, and also make money for their companies. That's so, I mean, it's, it's, we're in an unbelievable expansion. And the, and the concept that the free market doesn't work and we need to artificially boost salaries, I don't see where that comes from. Well, the argument, I will, I will say this, that there was a conservative who wrote an article from a think tank who said that maybe the conservatives should take a, take a look, different look at a minimum wage from the other side and, and, and saying that number one, it, for people who have jobs and the, the minimum wage, they're all they're getting paid, that is a pay increase, but it'll result in less people on welfare, less people receiving benefits from the government. That's the argument. But I wanted to, that, that's the argument they make and that's obviously an interesting debate. The other side of the argument, of course, as you all know, is increasing the minimum wage reduces opportunity, especially for young people. So that's the debate. But I want to talk about- And they need to be in school, not working. Exactly. Standard, Standard and Poor's, however, Paul, <laughs> uh, warned the state of Texas about income inequality and said that if and, and said that our dependence upon severance taxes and and shale gas and oil development is is going to fade and we are going to be left with a. a population that needs to be educated and needs health care and, and standards and poor's gave us a warning saying okay. you, our, your income inequality is becoming a problem look um, I, I'd love to see the warning because the warning is that the budget is over 200 billion dollars and rising on a biennium in the state of Texas the warning is that I guess we have a, a rainy day fund that's got eight and a half billion dollars in it and with the Robin Hood credits all this stuff it looks like you could break double digits I guess the warning is that we've got the best economy in the United States and so I have no idea what the warnings about David but we are you know the envy of every other you know, uh, capital in this country at the standpoint no, of but, government, but Paul, from the standpoint you, you, of job generation. You're just looking at, you're sugarcoating it. You're not looking at the reality that we're at, you know, we've got one of the highest uninsured rates of this in this country. One out of three people don't have insurance, even though they work. There are minimum wage jobs that either don't have it, can't pay so insurance. Can I blame Obamacare now? You, you can, you can, <laughs> okay. you, you can, you can, no, you can blame the state of Texas because we've had opportunities to fix that and we haven't. We've got one of the highest dropout rates among some of our children, and we don't have the best education uh, that we can we can give them. Uh, we're still under litigation uh, trying to equalize education, so we need to do whatever we can to make sure that every child has every opportunity. Even our veterans, about almost 70,000, could get Medicaid coverage if we would expand Medicaid, and we wouldn't have to worry about them standing in line and not getting treated What's right at the VA hospital. You, and you can't Patrick, ignore what are you people. Do? People is what drives the economy. They're the workers. Right. Well, and and right now we have the best economy anywhere in the United States. So the workers are being compensated at a higher per capita rate, and and, and they're getting raises. That's simply not true. No, it, the, the data, economic you, data about job creation is stunning, well, Sylvia. You, All right, well, go, we back, no, no, okay. go, go back to the budget book that was given <laughs> to us, and when it looks at the income levels and the n number of people coming to Texas and the income levels, and it's going down. Even Remember the question that, that uh, Sir Seferini asked, does this mean that even though we have more jobs, they're getting paid less? The answer was yes. Okay, that's well, that, that's that, what that, the Comptroller's Office okay, said. Okay, well, and, and the Senator Comptroller's Office is about ready to change. Gary, the has, Gary has a solution for our health care problems, and, and it is what Mike Pence, Governor Pence in Indiana did. Hey, I can tell and you what sure. my solution okay, is. So, uh, so what, what is, okay, our, what well. is our, what's the Texas solution so that we can well. access federal Medicaid money? <laughs> well, thank you, David. I mean, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm wanting Betancourt to, to tell me how we get it done. Well, if the, the as Paul as Are you going to answer for him? Well, I, and you're the one who said it was, it was the idea. <laughs> I worked on it. The uh, Mike Pence, who's the Republican governor of Indiana, when the Obama administration offered the additional funds for Medicaid, uh, came up with a, a healthy Hoosiers plan, which includes health savings accounts and other things that encourage people to be responsible about their health. And they sent it to Washington, and they got approval. 
And so then they got the money, but they got to do it under their own plan. So the real question, Paul, for, for our party going into the session is, should we look at a, a, a Republican version of how we deal with Medicaid and then see if the Obama okay. administration Somebody would bless knows it? This. Right now there's a sunset bill and they're looking at health and human services, which is a hugely complex uh, They're department. looking at a Texas solution, right. whatever that might Th be. That's exactly right. Well, now, Kyle Panic, Panic, Indiana, be good. who is the head of that department. Call the, the Texas range hands <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah. well, te that, just Texas solution is better. <laughs> anyway, so they're looking at a consolidation of those five giant departments. He theoretically will have 56,000 people working oh for him, and they're going to try to come up with a Texas solution, and, and I believe that we'll have a version of the Hoosier uh, plan here shortly, but that's a monumental job because you're looking at combining five agencies, uh, and that study's well underway. And, 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 now, and let me also make a point, because Sylvia was at a meeting where chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, Jay Nelson, said effectively declared victory in mental health because they had put extra money, and the wait times had gone to... Well, Remember? Zero. Again, it, That's I, my report I, from I the legislature. I was a little doubtful about that one. And so I'm a little <laughs> doubtful of the reports out of the comptroller's office, I, too. I, okay. well, honestly, <laughs> all, you, all you have to do is talk to our mental health and mental retardation authority here in Harris County, and I they cannot believe beds. that they don't have waiting well, they need, no, well, and no. I, So I may be that skeptical, too, and I like I'm a skeptical of that yeah. comptroller's report. Well, that's something. Because I don't but, see a lot of economics Going back to the that. Texas solution, I think uh, that was sort of brought forward last time a version of it and uh, it was not the Indiana plan I believe it was um, I think it was either ever somebody else's plan I can't remember maybe it was Kansas uh, because indeed a lot of the Republican conservative governors came around and, and did their own versions right. and, and, and the administration has been very open to working with Texas the on that. Is, if there's a but block we've just had music. one stubborn governor. We have a new well, governor. Let's see what there, there the new difference. governor yeah. let's see what the new a huge governor will be open There's to. a huge difference between Indiana and Texas because the people of Indiana is 82% Anglo and the people who are not going to be insured in Texas are mostly Hispanics okay. who don't vote for Republicans. So and, that's, and why, and and that's why that's why it, wherever it, it doesn't happen why, here. Why put up a race card on best practices? Because that's what David does. All right, because well. well, let's use best practices from wherever they work in the country, and let's export our best practices. Why not have that but rational discussion? But is it fair to say that we agree that the present way we do things in Texas with Medicaid is not sustainable long term? Well, I, there's no question that with that sunset bill coming up and, and what's happening with the entire de those department integration, you got a great chance to take a look at what conservatives would like as streamlining costs and what you know what liberals would like as more benefits. You know, right, you so can take a look at that. Well, next. let me just say this: it, when we've looked at best practice, Indiana has not been on that list. It's the first time, in fact, that I heard about Indiana was recently. The other thing I know about Indiana is that they're they're the only other state in this country that had a worse uh, uh, voter participation rate than we did a couple of weeks ago. I mean, oh, Texas okay. is still number 49. Yeah, I wonder why, especially after, uh, you know. Uh, what about the slush fund? And that uh, doesn't that, help. What are, the $45 million we, spent we by now, the people trying to turn we Texas now, blue. Right. No we, now, we now understand. That, that's, a, that's an old canard. Now, what, we, we now understand. The $45 million understand. that was wasted, go ahead. There's been an by, audit. By the, by the battleground Texas, I agree, it's wasted. The, the, the last Senate refused to look at and take any interest in the administration of the enterprise fund that the governor had, the emerging technology fund that the governor had. As it turns out, it's a slush fund for political allies. Right. What's, your question? What's, okay. your, what's your agenda okay. for fixing? That. Okay, the agenda is I, the lieutenant governor uh, to be at this point in time, Dan Patrick, has made it quite clear on on his uh, on wherever he campaigned in Texas, regardless of where the geography was, that 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 fund is something that he doesn't like and won't support. Greg Abbott has also made comments about uh, uh, making changes to that fund, and the reason why is because the economic conservatives we don't want to pick winners and losers which is what happens in those funds. So I expect those funds to be dramatically overhauled. Yeah, especially when they pick a lot of losers. Well, so. I, think, and, and we might, might, I might Kinda just like want to add that Speaker right. Strauss has already formed a committee on the House side, is already looking at that. And he's, already, he's already said, I, I saw him at being interviewed at the Texas Tribune Festival, he, he said he wants to make changes Good. there. And I think we need to. I think we do need to keep some tools in the toolbox, if you will, to make sure we continue to attract businesses. Of course, I want businesses with good paying jobs that bring insurance with them. Well, but here's businesses uh, you don't so, want, Sylvia. No, you don't but, want Paul, Solyndra because finish. that's but the same thing sure, at a national level. But, when, but let's make when sure that, picks, that when if they, we have agreements, they go bankrupt, that's that, bad. That they have agreements that give 
you know, what we're going to do, right. what the deliverables are, how many jobs you're going to create, and that we have a check on that to make sure that if they say they're going to create 6,000 jobs, that they I'm sure better. If not, listen, I, if not, we yank that money, that we get a refund, and we that we go back to for them to have it. That's a curse word in 13 David, years, yeah, I think. That's uh, right. Okay, but, but yeah. David, <laughs> and so I said it in a very gentle, lady like way. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm, just saying, right. I'm just saying yeah. it was the first one. But yeah. when I was a tax assessor, I was against the Cancer Prevention Research Institute Fund because there were no controls. Nobody in state government knew what they were doing. It was going to be Pandora's box, and we opened it, and it was Pandora's box. You were right. We have to decide that government has to think before they leap into this. This, and there clearly needs to be a lot better controls on these funds. In fact, as an economic conservative, I'd argue we shouldn't even have that particular right, fund. Let's at talk all. about S Senate organization. Sylvia, you're in the minority party. Uh, you're a Democrat. I'm one of the 11. You're one of the 11. <laughs> that's right. uh, well, I'm one of the 20. Yes. That's right. uh, do you? Uh, what, how would you like to see the Senate organized uh, this time, given the numbers? Well, I think, you know. I don't think I'm going to be called for advice, and I think uh, that it's something that is the prerogative of the lieutenant governor. I think, however, we need to follow the rules, and we need to follow tradition. And in some traditions, and because of practice, longstanding, have been sort of unwritten rules. And I think the, uh, the two-thirds rule is good and healthy for everybody concerned. It protects the minority, where the minority tends to, is, is, is a party minority or a minority of rural versus urban or a minority of, you know, farmers versus urban, urban setting, whatever it is, uh, because it really protects any kind of quirky, you know, bad issue coming to the fore. So I think it's and important. And David Dewar, didn't he throw it under and the I bus? Think it's didn't important. he throw it under the bus? Well, he has said that, that he wants to, to, to get not follow that and, and and that was something that the lieutenant governor also did during the special sessions and you saw how what a difference it was during our special well, the sessions tone got, uh, pretty nasty uh, between right, both sides right. and, 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 and that's what it is causes that's what it causes what i'm saying is that's why it's important to have it, it it's for a better more collegial cooperative uh uh, uh body uh to keep the two-thirds rule right, so, i think so it's so important Paul, i guess the question for you would be uh, should we organize the Senate like they do in Washington, like Harry Reid did, where the Republicans got the garbage oh, sure. and, the, and the Democrats rule? got it all? Okay, because that's or, what Harry did. He, and, and by the way, it didn't let's work take, too well. No, by the way. right. Let's take a, a page out of his playbook. Let's get retired, like Harry Reid just got retired when right. he lowered his. Uh, you know, he they took away the closure rule, which was set at sixty percent, which I think there's a nice valid argument for sixty percent, and he took it away to fifty. And of course, he's now on the sidelines. Um, so you, I think so that you agree the Democrats need to have a seat at the table. I mean, Sylvia got elected too. She's a state senator. She her voice is important. Well, I think you know. Uh, I mean, uh, there was no question that Senator Pat Patrick's concession. I mean, not concession. <laughs> acceptance Victory. speech. It was sorry. Uh, sorry, his one of his colleagues' concession speech. <laughs> he was very inclusive, wanting to listen, and I think he'll listen to everybody's input. But there's a logical argument for a 60 percent 19 number. Um, and, and as Sylvia said before, that when you go to special sessions, apparently there is no 21 rule, so it's just strictly majority rule, and, and, and she's not a fan of that. So why not compromise at 19 as opposed and to And you, Paul, do you anticipate 21? we're going to have Democratic chairman? Of do I anticipate years. we're going to have Democratic chairman? Uh, that's going to be up to the lieutenant governor. And he hasn't told well, okay. Sylvia has got a committee she and wants to have. Right. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's sort of another tradition, that more senior members of the Senate get to be the chair of committees. So when you look at who are the most senior members of the Senate, by and large, those are Democrats. So, so Paul shouldn't uh, be the head of finance yet? Well, no, he should not. I, I'm he not needs to wait in line <laughs> because he's going to be a rookie. He's going to be a freshman. Right. And he's going to get hazed by me and uh -oh. all the other more senior uh -oh, members because now okay. I've moved up. And I've moved up, you know, seven or and, eight spots. And slots. David, wow. you can see how this vicious so, cycle is so hazing I'm happy that Paul's his there child abuse I'm no and reality. Kid on the block. Okay. I'm happy Paul there. Well, and the, other, so, the, the, the vision that uh, the Republicans had uh, in the last two or three sessions, is it, will it continue to be the, the, that of do, doing whatever they can to keep minorities from voting, making <laughs> abortion impossible, make it impossible for Hispanic kids to get uh, in-state tuition, um, kids. allowing college kids to carry guns? Is, is that what we're going to be looking at for the next session, Sylvia? Well, we'll, we'll wait and see, but if we follow the, the campaign uh, uh, discussion, I mean, we might forecast that, yes, some of those things will happen. I mean, the, the lieutenant governor-elect did say that, that he did want to repeal the DREAM Act. He has said that more than once. 
Uh, the, the new governor has also said that he would support that. The new lieutenant governor, and I heard him, he spoke at the Texas Tribune Festival. It doesn't see why government would interfere with business to, to say that women should get the same pay as men do doing the same job. Uh, and then you, uh, I've, and then you something. I've never heard that. Uh, just look at the tapes from the Texas Tribune. He, I said right there. Equal repeal pay for the Dream Act. Equal, 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 equal said, pay he for said equal that, work Paul, is in the, said, is in said, the federal law. There's I'm no just way telling you what he said. That in the state law. Paul, that's okay. what he said. Paul, you got 30 seconds. Talk about the repeal of the Dream Act. Well, that's going to be the first agenda item of the no, Lieutenant you Governor. Know, I have, David, I have been on the campaign stuff <laughs> with these the campaign stuff with these gentlemen. I have heard about. Uh, border security. I've heard about property tax relief. I've got a book this thick, okay, uh, from uh, Governor to be Abbott's uh, group. I don't see that in there, okay, mm -hmm. at this point. Now, also, one thing we can agree, and we used to do this when we were county officials, we were actually Ten in seconds. LDA <laughs> and other places talking about the need to get Hispanic kids out of high school because that's yeah, really a up. big problem that we need to address. Right. Positive. 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 Okay. It, it's Senator. a positive we need note to read here. His tweet. Well, thank you both, Senator. Thank you. Oh, so all I can thanks. say is, if, if this discussion is any indication, we're in for a very lively legislative session. <laughs> we're we we looking forward civil, to though. it. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7.30 p.m. right here on TV8 and again Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you are saying about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org or on Facebook. And while you're there, don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.